Now, in, in case you've been living in a cave for the last few days, my name is Mark Murphy, and when I'm not doing colonoscopies or writing columns for the newspaper, uh, I do serve as president of the Savannah Book Festival Board of Directors, and on behalf of my fellow board members, Executive Director Kim Bakyasu and the rest of the hardest working crew in show business and the more than 250 volunteers who make this festival reality every year, I'm thrilled for, that you're all here for an afternoon with the fantabulous, that's my word, fantabulous Christina Baker Klein. We are fortunate to have some other special volunteers helping out this afternoon, book lovers just like all of you. They are our ushers from the Monday Night Book Readers and the Island Bookies Book Club, so let's give them a hand as well. Okay, so please indulge me one last time for a couple of housekeeping notes. I know you've all heard a few times this weekend. To make this more interesting, I'm going to pantomime these to see if you can recite them. Okay, first, please turn off your cell phones. No cameras, please, no flash photography. Well, cameras, yes, but no flash photography. And finally, Exactly. During the Q&A, they will be bringing you a microphone if you raise your hand. Thank you very much. Immediately following the presentation, Christina Becker-Klein will be autographing copies of our festival purchased books, a numbered signing card provided by our booksellers from Eclipse Places you in line. As usual, lines will form to the left of the stage and we'll be calling you up in groups of 50. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Jonathan Rapp. Jonathan is a Savannah Book Festival board member, SCAD professor, an accomplished actor and singer, husband, father, and general man about town. He's also a critically acclaimed novelist, one of our presenting authors this year, and a great friend of the festival. Please welcome Jonathan Rapp. It's a pleasure to introduce my dear friend, Christina Baker Klein. She's the author of the highly acclaimed novel, Orphan Train, which spent more than two years on the New York Times bestseller list, published in 35 countries and with two million copies in print. Orphan Train illuminated a largely hidden chapter in American history while beautifully portraying the coming of age of two resilient young women. And this afternoon, we have a festival first. Christina has graciously given the festival exclusive early access to her new novel, A Piece of the World, two weeks before its international release. You can be the first to own this remarkable book. Combining fact and fiction, her latest story explores friendship and art as inspired by Andrew Wyeth's iconic painting, Christina's World. And this afternoon, it truly is her world. So please help me welcoming Christina Baker Klein. Hello, Savannah. How exciting is this? I am so thrilled to be here. Um, I'm thrilled for a lot of reasons. First of all, as you know, this is my pub week, and my book is out on Tuesday, so to have this sort of um, sneak peek and be able to talk to people. It's getting me all excited for this release of a book that almost killed me to write, as you'll hear in a minute. Um, but even more than that, what a gorgeous city. This was so much fun. And here we are at the end of this incredible weekend. So, um, you know, I'm here as a writer, but I'm also here as a fan. And what a joy to get to hear these various you know, writers talk about their work, to meet people, to explore the city. So I want to give you, before I get started here, I want to give you a couple of quick highlights about my weekend. So first of all, uh, I sat next to Colson Whitehead on the plane. <laughs> yeah, that was the beginning. I walked onto the plane, and it was, I could tell, you know how like if you're on a plane with Brad Pitt, there's a buzz? and everyone's sort of humming, and the plane was filled with writers. So I was like, it's probably not Brad Pitt. Who would be here? And then there he was, sitting right beside me with his sunglasses on, on the plane. Um, and so I shamelessly and very uncoolly gushed over his book, and he was like, yeah, whatever. I get that all the time. 
And then his wife, who is a literary agent, whom I happen to know, was like, Christina, hello. And all of a sudden, he was like, well, maybe, OK, I'll say hello to you now. <laughs> Um, but then he put his headphones in and that was it for the rest of the journey. But it was very, very exciting to sit next to him. My second wonderful moment is that um, as soon as I landed, I had a Bloody Mary with Dottie Frank. Now, if you've ever read Dorothea Benton Frank's novels, or if you've met her, you might be able to imagine that drinking with Dottie in the middle of the afternoon is a very fun experience. Then. My dear friend Caroline Levitt, novelist, saved me a place at the Colson Whitehead sold out talk, so that was really fun to get to see her. On Friday in my hometown, Caroline is doing the, she's introducing me, it's, so it'll be, it was a great honor and joy to see her here. Then I went riding on Vespas with Jane Green <laughs> and um, Thomas Dolby. And I was telling my husband about it. I said, yeah, we had this amazing time. It was so much fun. Jane Green, like this huge mega writer. And it was just great. And this guy named Thomas Dolby, who I guess wrote a book. And my husband was like, wait a minute. Thomas Dolby, who wrote She Blinded Me With Science? And I said, I don't know, maybe. And he was like, oh my god, do you understand who that is? So my husband and sons are very impressed about Thomas Dolby, even though I didn't know the whole story first. Then um, I got to tell Tess Gerritsen that a talk she gave a couple years ago inspired my new novel that I'm working on now, the one after this one. So that was a big fan moment. I ate Muscles with Jonathan Rabb and Joya Diliberto at Circa 1875 last night. Super fun. I hung out until the wee hours with um, 80s icons Jay McInerney and <laughs> Tama Janowitz at my hotel feeling like a character in one of their books. It was very exciting. And finally this morning, I had a long breakfast with um, Imbolo, Imbolo Bui, who taught me how to pronounce her name. And she also said that I really missed out by not going to Paula Dean's restaurant. So maybe next time I'll do that. Um, but anyway, so I've had a terrific experience as a fan. And now what I'm going to do is take you through um, the story of this new novel piece of the world, um, which I think you'll soon understand <laughs> was a, a, a journey of love and uh, quite a project. Here is, here is the painting that inspired it all, Christina's World by Andrew Wyeth. I suspect that many of you have seen it before. It hangs in the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. All right, so let's get going here. Here I am. <laughs> the oldest in this picture, um, my parents and my sister and I had just moved to Bangor, Maine from um, Johnson City, Tennessee. My dad is from Georgia. He's from North Georgia, right near Chattanooga. My mother is from Gastonia, North Carolina, so I'm 100% Southern. And um, my dad, I know, isn't it exciting? My dad had accepted a teaching job at the University of Maine. He was a history professor. And so we were this young family, moved to Maine. Um, and here we are, our first winter there. We were, my parents were sort of culture vultures. And you can, isn't this perfect for the 70s, the shag rug? Um, here I am reading, as I was always doing. Um, but my dad was really, um, he really wanted to give us a big cultural experience. He read bedtime stories to us every night. And um, I wrote an article for the New York Times this week about how we ambushed E.B. White at his house. <laughs> we, we did things like that. My dad was quite an adventurer. So um, here we are with E.B. White, um, my sisters and I with him. And in fact, um, we also did a similar thing at Christina Olson's house. So the house that's in that painting exists, and it it's about an hour and a half from where I grew up Bang in Bangor. And one day, my father got it in his head to go to the house. And at the time, it was not part of the museum. Now it is. It's part of the Farnsworth Museum. But we basically trespassed on private property. And here's the article I wrote. And the artist imagined what we would look like, our family sitting in the field at the bottom of the hill there, where Christina Olson sat. So. I am Christina, as you know, and my mother's name is also Christina. Um, my grandmother is also, so I'm the third Christina. And my grandmother, Christina, I just want to go back and show you this. Oh, they said I can go back. Yeah. She's actually in this photograph. 
She was born within a few years of Christina Olson. They grew up in a very similar way. They both lived in rural farmhouses they, with no amenities, no heat, running water, electricity. My grandmother, like Christina Olson, had a degenerative illness as a child, a form of polio. Um, so there were all these kind of resonances um, with her. That's a photo of my grandmother with the bow in her hair, and there's Christina Olson. You can see that these photos were taken at a similar moment. That was a year before my grandmother actually was orphaned in um, South Carolina. Here's another connection. So, you know, I had this, m as I was growing up, I had long, kind of dirty blonde hair, and my father would sometimes remark that I looked like the girl in the painting from behind. And um, this is a woodcut that he got for me when I was very young. Uh, I was eight, and it's still hanging, it hangs on my bedroom wall today. Um, but it was inspired, the artist said, by the painting Christina's World. That's me at that age, so you can see there's a little bit of resemblance. This is a painting that a Maine artist did of my mother walking through a field up to the house that eventually they bought on the coast of Maine in Southwest Harbor. Um, the house in this painting and the house um, that they bought became the inspiration for the house in my novel Orphan Train, actually, that Vivian lives in. But as you can see, the setting and the sort of style of this is exactly like Christina's world. And again, this artist said she was um, influenced by it. So I had all these kind of resonances in my own story. But it's not just my own story. It wasn't only ours. There are many, many cultural associations with this um, painting, and I'm going to take you through a couple of them. Here, of course, is Dorothy um, watching her house go up. Mary Poppins. Princess Leia. <laughs> Wiley Coyote, so moving on to television shows, Wiley Coyote, Iron Man. <laughs> Mr. Burns, and a more recent one, The Walking Dead. <laughs> uh, the painting Christina's World has also been used for social commentary. Here she is in a factory setting, oil spill. Uh, a barren nuclear landscape, a post-apocalyptic dystopia. It's also been used for political commentary. I don't know if anyone saw this. Chris Christie's world. Or perhaps this. <laughs> That was a few days before the election. And then someone just sent me this. Carrie Ann Weems is a famous Southern photographer. You may have seen her work. She did this um, as she's an African-American woman, and she did this homage and social commentary um, on the plantation. So the painting has been used in fashion. Here's another fashion shoot. Another fashion shoot. It's been used in movies. This is Days of Heaven. Terrence Malick said he was very influenced by it. Forrest Gump. I don't know if any of you have watched Outlander, but the, um, the director said that he was influenced by the painting and by Wyeth's work. And Westworld ha was also inspired in part by this painting. And there are many other examples of that. And then <laughs> it's influenced illustration. People have done so many crazy things. Toast. There's a whole website of toast. Tattoos. And check out this birdhouse of <laughs> the Olsen's house. And of course, let's not forget cats. I particularly like this one with the mice floating, <laughs> floating through the sky. So the painting has come to symbolize a lot of things to a lot of different people, but there's often a kind of universal response to it, which is that this woman in the field, there's something 
odd about her, that she's vulnerable in some kind of way. And here, of course, is a very clear uh, representation of that. The actress Claire Danes did a Broadway show, a dance show, where she portrayed Christina Olsen, um, who, by the way, had a degenerative disease that over time got worse and worse. And um, this was about, I don't know, six years ago, and Claire did this. Um, ballet that you can see on YouTube actually, kind of acting out what she thought it would have been like. The photographer Cindy Sherman, who photographs herself in all these different ways, imagined what it would look like if Christina Olsen turned her head. And you know, that's sort of the impulse of my own novel. What would it look like if this woman actually turned her head? And the truth is, we don't know who she is, right? She's a mystery. Her back is turned to us. We never get to see her expression. And why is this painting so famous? Is it the girl? Is it the girl? Is it the landscape? You know, Wyeth famously said that after he finished the painting, he was tempted to paint her out because she felt that he had conveyed enough about her that it would come through anyway. And in fact, here's a fascinating this look. This is a study for a painting he did called Winds from the Sea. And you can see that he essentially has drawn over this figure of Christina. And then here's the finished painting. But in Christina's world, he kept that figure. So over the years, I've come to believe that this painting is a Rorschach test, a magic trick, a sleight of hand. The down-to-earth naturalism of Wyeth's paintings is deceptive. In his work, all is not as it seems. His paintings always have an undercurrent of wonder and mystery. He was fascinated with the darker aspects of human experiences. And I think you can get glimpses of this in the dry as bones grasses rendered in startlingly precise detail, the wreck of a house on a hill with the mysterious ladder leading to a second story window, a lone piece of laundry floating like an apparition in the breeze. At first glance, this slim woman in the grass appears to be languidly relaxed, but a closer look reveals odd dissonances. Her arms are strangely thin and twisted. Maybe she's older than she appears. She seems poised, alert, yearning toward the house, and yet hesitant. Is she afraid? Her face is turned from the viewer, but she appears to be gazing at a darkened window on the second floor. What does she see in its shadow? So I after I finished writing my novel, Orphan Train, I began to look for another story that would essentially occupy me as completely, that would engage, engage my mind and heart. I'd learned so much about early 20th century America as part of my research, and I thought it would be fruitful to linger in that time period. I'd become particularly interested in rural life, how people get by, and what emotional tools they need to survive hard times. As with Orphan Train, I liked the idea of taking a real historical moment of some significance and blending fiction and nonfiction, filling in the details, illuminating a story that had been unnoticed or obscured. So one day, several after months after the novel came out, a writer friend remarked that she'd recently seen the painting where it hangs at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and she thought of me. And instantly, I knew I'd found my subject for all those reasons I told you earlier. So for the past two years, I've immersed myself in Christina's world. I sat in front of this actual painting at the Museum of Modern Art, listening to the enthused, perturbed, dismissive, passionate comments from pa uh, passers-by all over the globe. My favorite one was a Danish woman who said, it's just so creepy. <laughs> I studied the works of the three famous Wyeths, N.C. Wyeth, the father, Andrew Wyeth, the son, and then his son, um, Andrew Wyeth's son, Jamie, to get a sense of their rich and complex family history. This is Treasure Island. Um, N.C. Wyeth was an illustrator as well as a painting, and some of you may recognize his very well-known illustrations. Jamie Wyeth, this is a painting by him, was, as you can see, quite influenced by his father. He used color more liberally, and he took, he, he sort of went off in another direction, but you can, I think you can really see the influence. 
In Maine, I became intimately familiar with the Farnsworth Museum, of which the house is now a part, um, in Rockland, which has an entire building devoted to Wyeth art, and the Christina's World Homestead in Cushing right here, an old saltwater farm. I interviewed art historians and, Amer um, and uh, American historians, and I was lucky to get to know several tour guides at the house um, who sent me all kinds of stuff, articles and letters. I interviewed family members, I interviewed curators, um, I read lots and lots of books. And as I went through this process, I realized that not only was Christina obviously a real person who died in the late 60s, but Wyeth had only died in 2009. His widow is still alive, his children are alive. Many people who are in the novel are alive. And as with Orphan Train, I decided ultimately that I wanted to be as factually accurate as I possibly could, even though I know a lot of writers don't feel that way, a lot of novelists. My friend Lily King, for example, who wrote the novel Euphoria, which is an amazing novel inspired in part by Margaret Mead. Um, she did not feel that compunction to be accurate. She said, I'm gonna do what I wanna do and I'll use it as a rough guide and then I'll go off and, you know, and kind of create my story. But with this story, again, because I felt that I had this responsibility, a lot of people only see the painting and don't know anything else, I mean, most people. And so if I was gonna tell her story, I kind of wanted it to be the story that people um, would know that they could believe. So here's what I discovered. Christina Olson descended on one side from the notorious chief magistrate of the Salem witch trials, and on the other from a poor Swedish peat farming clan, was uniquely poised to become an American icon. In Wyeth's painting, she is resolute and yearning, hardy and vulnerable, exposed and enigmatic. Alone in a sea of grass, she is the archetypal individual against a backdrop of nature, fully present in the moment, and yet a haunting reminder, I think, of the immensity of time. As a MoMA curator who wrote the book about her there says, the painting is more of a psychological landscape than a portrait, a portrayal of a state of mind rather than a place. Like Whistler's Mother by James Whistler, an American Gothic by Grant Wood. Um, this painting celebrates rugged individualism, I believe, and quiet strength, defiance in the face of obstacles, and perseverance. This is the earliest photograph of Christina Olson. She's the little girl. She's the girl standing in this picture. She was born in 1893 and grew up on this barren hill in Cushing, Maine. That is the house in the painting with three brothers in a house that their family had lived in for generations. By all accounts from an early age, here's Christina, and here's her little brother Alvaro. Alvaro. By all accounts, she was an active and vibrant presence. She had a lust for life, a fierce intelligence, and a determination not to be pitied, despite the degenerative disease that eventually stole her mobility. Here she is. Um, as a young woman. Though she was never correctly diagnosed in her lifetime, neurologists now believe that she had a syndrome called Marie Charcot Marie Tooth, a hereditary disorder that damages the nerves to her arms and legs. Christina refused to use a wheelchair, and as she became increasingly immobilized, she took to dragging herself around. Here she is with the man who eventually ended up breaking her heart, Walton Hall. Here's Christina a lovely young woman. As she, a few years went by, you can see already that um, the signs of the d disease have become more evident here. And she became increasingly immobilized. So in 1939, Wyeth showed up at Christina's front door along with Betsy James, his future wife, who'd been visiting the Olson farm since she was a little girl. Andrew Wyeth was 22 years old, Betsy James was 17, and Christina Olson at that time was 46. And these two were married within 10 months. So they show up at the front door, and that day he does his first painting, the, his first of 300 paintings of the Olson house and surroundings. And at the time he was using a lot more color. His wife Betsy eventually convinced him um, to pare back and really use black, brown, and white, and that's what he ended up doing. Um, he started coming around almost daily, and um, as I describe in the book, he was this incredibly charismatic, incredibly warm, 
movie star handsome guy. Um, and Christina was sort of overwhelmed by him. But they very quickly had this connection. Um, he had actually also battled um, a disease in his youth. He, had, he walked with an uneven gait, and he kind of related to her for that reason. What he said about the house was, the world of New England is in that house, spidery like crackling skeletons rotting in the attic, dry bones. It's like a tombstone to sailors lost at sea, the Olson ancestor who fell from the yard arm of a square rigger and was never found. It's the doorway of the sea to me, he said, of mussels and clams and sea monsters and whales. There's a haunting feeling there of people coming back to a place. So there's the house. And as you can see, he's, he's got a lot of fidelity. So I'm going to show you now some paintings, some photographs and some paintings. This is the front hall. Here's, here is Wyeth talking to Alvaro. And there's a painting he did of Alvaro in the front hall. Here's a view from the second floor, his rendering of that view. This is the stove, which if you read my novel, you'll find out figures prominently. Here's a painting he did of it. This is the scratched blue door that um, Christina's grandmother left it open. It was between the shed and the kitchen for the witches to come and go. On the scaffold in Salem, a witch had put a curse on the family of the Hathorns that they would forevermore be cursed with these witches, the presence of the witches. And they all kind of believed that they were. It's Wyeth's painting of that door. This is um, Alvaro's beloved dory that he went out fishing in until he had to take over the farm. And he said it was too painful to look at it because he couldn't go out in it anymore. So he put it in the attic. There's Wyeth's painting of it. And here are Christina's beloved geraniums that she grew for her whole life in the kitchen. Here's another photograph of them. And here's one of the earliest photographs that, that Wyeth did of Christina. It took a long time for him to start painting her. But in time, he began incorporating her into her paintings. And then for more than 30 years, she was his muse and inspiration. He says, what interested me about her was that she'd come in at odd places, odd times. The great, and here's a doorknob I just want to show you in this next photograph, is in this, I'm sorry, in this painting. The great English painter John Constable used to say that you never have to add life to a scene, for if you sit quietly and wait, life will come, sort of an accident in the right spot. That happened to me all the time. It happened lots with Christina. Here she is much older. Quick of wit and sharp of tongue, Christina was a force to be reckoned with. Late in life, with her straw-like hair and her hooked nose, her spinsterhood, as they said then, and independent nature, she was rumored among some of the townspeople of Cushing to be a witch herself. Andrew Wyeth variously called her a witch and a queen and the face of Maine. But they had such this incredible relationship. You know, he adored her, and they spent hours together. Um, they were similar, as I said. Both of them embraced austerity but craved beauty. They were curious about other people and yet pathologically private. They were both perversely independent and yet reliant on others to take care of their basic needs. Christina, her brother Alvaro, and um, Wyeth on his wife Betsy. So then he began these sketches. And he says, my memory can be more of a reality than the thing itself. I kept thinking about the day I would paint Christina in her pink dress like a faded lobster shell I might find on a beach, crumpled. I kept building her in my mind, a living being there on the hill where the grass was really growing. Someday she was going to be buried under it. Soon her figure was actually going to crawl across the hill in the picture toward that dry timber box of a, of a house on the top. I felt the loneliness of that figure, perhaps the same that I felt myself as a kid. It was as much my experience as hers. In Christina's world, Wyeth said, I worked on that hill for a couple of months, that grass, building up the ground to make it come toward you, a surge of earth like the whole planet. When it came time to lay Christina's figure against the planet I'd created for her all those weeks, I put this pink tone on her shoulder, 
and it almost blew me across the room. In becoming an artist muse, a seemingly passive role, Christina finally achieved the autonomy and purpose she'd craved her entire life. Instinctively, I believe, Wyeth managed to get at the core of herself. In the painting, she's paradoxically singular and yet representative. She's vibrant and vulnerable. She is solitary, but surrounded by the ghosts of her past. Like the house, like the landscape, she perseveres. As an embodiment of the strength of the human character, she is vibrant, pulsating, immortal. So I want to read you a page, uh, the beginning of my novel, which is the prologue. And the story takes place in Christina's head, in her voice. Um, and essentially, it's the story of what led her to the moment of that painting. I'll go back to that. Oh, just turned it off. Mistake. Oh, now I don't know what to do. Let's try it again. There we go. Oh, it worked. Magic. Later, he told me he'd been afraid to show me the painting. He thought I wouldn't like the way he portrayed me, dragging myself across the field, fingers clutching dirt, my legs twisted behind, the arid moonscape of wheatgrass and timothy, that dilapidated house in the distance, looming up like a secret that won't stay hidden. Faraway windows, opaque and unreadable, ruts in the spiky grass made by an invisible vehicle leading nowhere, dishwater sky. People think the painting is a portrait, but it isn't, not really. He wasn't even in the field. He conjured it from a room in the house, an entirely different angle. He removed rocks and trees and outbuildings. The scale of the barn is wrong, and I am not that frail young thing but a middle-aged spinster. It's not my body, really, and not even my head. He did get one thing right, sometimes a sanctuary, sometimes a prison. That house on the hill has always been my home. I've spent my life yearning toward it, wanting to escape it, paralyzed by its hold on me. There are many ways to be crippled, I've learned over the years, many forms of paralysis. My ancestors fled to Maine from Salem, but like anyone who tries to run away from the past, they brought it with them. Something inexorable seeds itself in the place of your origin. You can never escape the bonds of family history, no matter how far you travel. And the skeleton of a house can carry in its bones the marrow of all that came before. Who are you? Christina Olson, he asked me once. Nobody had ever asked me that. I had to think about it for a while. If you really want to know me, I said, we'll have to start with the witches, and then the drowned boys, the shells from distant lands, a whole room full of them, the Swedish sailor marooned in ice. I'll need to tell you about the false smiles of the Harvard man and the hand-wringing of those brilliant Boston doctors, the dory in the haymow, and the wheelchair in the sea. And eventually, though neither of us knew it yet, we'd end up here, in this place, within and without the world of the painting. Thank you. All right, I am really happy to take questions, but if I could see you, can I see you? Um, okay, great. Um, questions, yes, over on the left. I can repeat what you say. It's a delight, I'm so happy to be here. Interesting. The haint blue that she's talking about, the color of the doors, and I know the word haint, but I didn't know about haint blue. Well, 
well, I really kind of wish I had talked to you about six months ago. Because <laughs> you can bet that would have ended up in the book. Um, I just revised Orphan Train, actually, and I added a whole new 10-page scene. Um, I was obsessed with, I always get this question every, I'm so glad not to be talking about Orphan Train anymore, because I always get this question. And from the beginning, I'm, this is a whole different subject, but, uh, you know. Um, she was talking about how th there's this incredible haint blue and that, uh, in fact, shutting the door would have kept the spirits out. And I love that metaphor, and I'm angry that I didn't know about it sooner. Um, but to go back to Orphan Train for a second, um, sometimes there are second chances. And um, I had always wanted to add a scene that my readers felt very strongly that I should have included, and I came to believe I'd really made a mistake by not including, um, and so I did. And in November, I wrote that scene, and I went through and you know, cleaned up a few things that have been bothering me, and it was a really exciting thing, so who knows, that could happen again. So thank you for that. Um, another question, yes? The man in the blue, or the woman in the black, I guess? Yes. Thank you. You had said that Christina had this disease and yeah. she wouldn't use a wheelchair. She dragged herself around the house. And then also that in the picture of Christina's world that her arm is at a strange angle, etc. Is she dragging herself across that meadow? Yeah, she was. So um, as you'll see when you, it went if you read the novel, when you read the novel, um, Wyeth had seen her, he painted in an upstairs room, and her parents were buried, the whole Olson family was buried in a graveyard at the bottom of the field, and she would drag herself down to the graveyard every few days to visit her parents in the summer. He saw her out the window, and he never painted her in that spot. She posed for him up near the house, and he did all those sketches, and then he took the sketches upstairs and painted her from, that's why I say he painted her from a different angle. He wasn't even in the field. Um, you know, eventually, w when Wyeth died, he had asked um, Christina Olson's brother if he could be buried in the graveyard. So his gravestone is right in that family graveyard, right next to Christina. Isn't that amazing? You can't make it up. I mean, the thing is, uh, writing this book, the more I learned about this family, wait till, I mean, you'll see when you read it, on the one hand, my editor hates it when I say this. Nothing happens in this book. It's about someone who lives in her house for her entire life and becomes increasingly disabled and never goes anywhere. But the truth is, um, this family is so fascinating and there are these incredible stories and there are all these metaphors about the witches and there's just all this stuff they incorporated, not to mention the fact that Christina Olsen's father was stranded in ice as a Swedish sailor, walked across the ice, knocked on the door of that house and, uh, married the woman who answered the door, Christina's spinster mother, so who was thir in her much older than he was in her mid-30s. So there were just all these fascinating stories, and I loved, I loved actually being able to tell them. More, more questions? Yeah. I think this presentation was fascinating. Thank you, Christine. It, Thank I'm you. looking forward to looking, uh, to reading the book based on seeing these images. I think that would be very helpful. While you were talking, I thought there's there's so much emotion that you have to write about with somebody with their disabling and changes yeah. in their life. And I was going to ask you about Orphan Train, even though I know you didn't want Just to talk about it anymore. Just don't ask me that anymore. one particular question. No, <laughs> I, my question is sort of generalized for both of them. There was such pain and emotion when I read The Orphan Train. I cried frequently. And with the uh, various children and children helping each other and broken love affairs. and. Uh, you as an author, is that so um, draining to you as an author to have to, you have to step aside sometimes? And She's asking about how, okay, you do realize that you just asked me the exact same question I asked Colson Whitehead. <laughs> I asked him if it was, you know, if it was draining for him to write, because it was extremely draining for me to do this book. Harder than Orphan Train, much harder, because it's such an interior story. Um, it's a, a first person narration. Um, it's a woman who was thwarted at every turn, and I think the fact that she really existed, she was, she was by all accounts very smart, but at 12 years old, 
the local school teacher came to her father and said, I want this girl to take over the school. I want her to keep getting educated and then she can run the schoolhouse. This teacher was, knew she would be retiring in you know, six or seven years. And her father said, no. He took her out of school at 12 and she had to run the farm. And she had this debilitating illness that nobody could figure out. It was incredibly painful. She fell in love with this cad who broke her heart. And it doesn't give anything away to say that because the book opens and you know that she's sort of been through all this stuff. Um, but she's got this incredible spirit. I mean, in real life she did. And I, interviewing people who knew her, that was my great joy, was showing that, two joys. Number one, I got to show that she had this persevering spirit. And that was, you know, writing about a character who has such autonomy and such will was very exciting. Um, and then two, Wyeth came into her life and he just added color. He transformed her life. And she was very aware, I think, as his subject, that she, it was a, it gave her a chance at something greater than a normal happy life. It gave her immortality, as I said at the end. And, and I think that was a very meaningful thing to her. So ultimately, I feel that it's a happy story. My question is, um, how did she react emotionally to the painting? I know you said she crit critiqued the barn being too, you know, those kind of things. But yeah. uh, how did she react emotionally? And at what point was she still alive when it became very famous and, and acclaimed? And did she, um, was she in the spotlight? So yes, yeah, okay. So the painting was done in 1948. Wyeth, as I just read to you, was afraid to show her the painting because it was this, hybrid, um, it wasn't all her, and he didn't know how she would react. Um, I do a lot with that in the book, as you'll see. Um, she loved it, she loved it. She felt that he had captured something, something about how she saw herself. And that was a real challenge to get that right on the page, as you'll see in the book. Um, she kissed his hand and she was proud of it. But it did transform her life, she was very famous quickly because um, the painting was immediately bought by the Museum of Modern Art. Um, you know, it was displayed, it was, it was in all kinds of publications. People started making pilgrimages to the house. One morning she woke up from, she slept in the, she couldn't go up the stairs at that point and she slept on the dining room floor on a pallet and she woke up and there was a tourist standing over her asking her if she was Christina Olsen. Um, people would always come to the door and often just walk in because their house was sort of open that way. Um, but, you know, at the same time that I think other family members might have gotten a little irritated, she was very patient with people and I think she actually kind of enjoyed the notoriety and the fame. I think she kind of liked it. Maybe not being woken up that way, but I think she generally liked it. Next. Yes. How famous was Wyatt at this point when he painted this painting? Because Mama great, bought it right away. And that's a great question. She's asking how famous Wyatt was. He was actually very famous. Um, even before he came to her house, he had been featured on the cover of, I guess, Art News Magazine. Uh, he was on the cover of Life. He, um, he was, N.C. Wyatt was famous, his father, and then Andrew Wyatt you know, became, sort of followed in his footsteps, but became um, a, a sort of more respectable artist. His paintings were beloved, but Christina's world was like nothing he had ever done before, and it cemented his reputation as a, a major American artist. There was then a huge backlash against him in the 1960s. Um, when pop art and minimalism came in, a lot of people thought he was a hack, thought he was, um, you know, representational drivel, Hallmark card kind of uh, stuff. He was dismissed. Um, his obituary, in fact, was pretty damning by Michael Kimmelman in the New York Times. But over the past couple of decades, he's been reclaimed by art historians and curators. Um, uh, what they call what he did metaphoric realism, um, in which he heightened the ordinary. Um, he, his style is American regionalism, uh, mixed with figurative surrealism. 
And there's a new book called Reclaiming Andrew Wyeth, which is filled with essays by art historians and curators talking about uh, where he kind of fits in the world today. And I believe that his reputation will be thoroughly rehabilitated and that he will have a firm place in American art and that he already does. I will tell you, however, that the Museum of Modern Art, in my view, is not the right place for this painting. They bought it. It's now priceless. They won't let it travel because of that, but they don't know what to do with it. Um, it's hanging in a hallway. There's no context for it. And I was talking with a well-known curator who, uh, in the, the art world, who had worked at MoMA, and he said the perfect place for this painting would be the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. They would build a wing for it. They would contextualize it with Hopper and you know uh, Grant Wood and Whistler and all these other American artists of, who influenced Wy Wyeth or painted around the same time. And there would be a kind of way in which it's incorporated into the fabric of our understanding of American art, whereas at MoMA, it's just this bizarre outlier in the hallway by the bathroom. <laughs> so it's kind of a shame, and uh, I wish that would change, but it's interesting. It is exciting to be on the cusp of your book. I'm assuming people in the audience can't have read it yet. <laughs> uh, yeah. Do you want your readers to believe what they read as being factual? I know you spoke to that at the very beginning. Right. So I know most novelists don't do this, but I just wanted to. I wrote a nonfiction essay at the end of the novel about what's essentially the story, about what's real. Because um, I wanted the readers actually to feel that they, they knew they could tease that apart. To be honest with you, pretty much everything is accurate. Um, I mean, obviously I did not dwell inside Christina Olson, so her inner journey is my imagining. But the facts of the story, as much as I could uh, adhere to them, are accurate. And you know what's difficult and fascinating about that for me is that it made my life so hard to do that. Novelists usually start with motivations and lead toward actions, right? You have a character, you're building a character, you understand how your character acts in the world and then things happen as a result of that. In this case, I was writing about someone who made things happen or responded to things in a way that I would never have had a character respond or do. So for I'll give you an example. Um, when Christina was very young, under 10 years old, when she was three, she had a kind of flu-like experience that was the beginning of this degenerative disease, and her, there was something wrong with her legs. So she was, I don't remember, seven or eight, and she, her father made an appointment with her to go to Rockland, which was a sort of, when you had a horse and buggy, not easy to get to. It was a big day trip. He was a farmer. He had to take a day off. It was winter. It was bad conditions. He packed her up. You know, he had an appointment with the doctor. He drove her to Rockland, and she just refused. She threw a fit, and she refused to go to the doctor. And her father was, by all accounts, this stern, strong-willed man who had been a ship captain. I mean, a sailor. He, he was no pushover, and yet he turned around and drove back the four or five hours or six hours without... You know, that's, that's the story. That's what really happened. How in the world did that happen? I have three kids. I would never let that happen. Um, but so I had to sort of make that plausible. And there are a number of other things in the book that happened that, um, here's, a, I'll give you another example. At a, I won't give anything away, but at a certain point, Christina's best friend, this is the real nonfiction story, her best friend said something to her that made her angry she was sort of pushing her to do something. And Christina, and by the way, Cushing, Maine, tiny, tiny place. Maybe 60 people live there. They both live in this town. I mean, Christina's in a farmhouse, her friend's in another farmhouse right down the road. And she said to her, if you keep pushing me, I am never speaking to you again. And her friend said, don't be ridiculous. And she said, come on, you know you should do this. And Christina never spoke to her again. Never spoke to her again. How does that happen? So, so in that case, and in the, my novel, there are a lot of real names, but in that case, I had to build in motivation. So that friend became, became a kind of frenemy. 
know that term frenemy, half friend, half enemy. She undermined Christina a little bit. She sort of made fun of her every now and then. She just wasn't that kind. And for in the novel, it's sort of the final straw. I mean, I've got to believe that's what happened in real life, that it was a final straw of some kind. So I changed her name to Gertrude Gibbons, which I love. Um, <laughs> I'll tell you her real name. It was Olive Rivers, which I really loved. So I hated to get rid of that. But, but I felt that I, I had to, I didn't know the truth of that. So, but, um, but you know, so, so it was just an interesting task for me as a writer to work with these real facts. And actually, I will say, I, we may or maybe are done, but I will say that, Hard as it was for me to do that, it taught me something about, I mean, how long have I been doing this novel writing business? I have s six novels. Um, I've been doing it for a long time and I feel it taught me how to write a novel because I learned something about actually doing, I, so this novel is not predictable because real life is not predictable. And that was very interesting to experience as a writer. As I say, Things happened in her real life that made me gasp, and as a result, they'll probably make you gasp. So making them psychologically resonant, uh, making them make sense to my readers, that, that, was, what, that was what my job was. Do, do we have time for more. any more? Yeah? <coughs> Hello. Hi. As an author, do you... Um, find it hard to withstand criticism of your books? <laughs> that is a very good, do you have some for me? That is such a good question. I am in a moment, in just a moment, when I am going to probably be getting a lot of criticism of my work. Um, I was just talking about that with another novelist this morning, um, Imbolo Bui. I'm, I'm thinking I'm pronouncing it the way she told me to, um, who's wonderful. She wrote this novel called Behold the Dreamers, and she says she, at first her agent would send her all the reviews, but they kept her up all night long, and she asked her to stop sending them. Um, you know, it's, just, it's a very good question. I actually think if you can stand, a lot of writers don't like to read their reviews. I think if you can stand it, and if you're in it for the long haul, as I clearly am writing all these books, um, you can learn something from the critical reviews. Not all of them. Sometimes people just don't like cats or whatever. Um, and you know, everybody has opinions. I just wrote this piece, uh, as I told you, I wrote an, an this is, I was having this conversation today. I wrote an article for the New York Times. There are all these comments about it. I wrote an article last summer, a big article, and it was, I wrote about how my three sisters and I all have houses on the coast of Maine and we had to scrimp and save to make that happen. And one of my sister lives there year, year round. She's married to a carpenter, she's a librarian. You know, my parents were poor, but they sort of taught us the value of togetherness. And I had all these responses that were like, you rich people, you know, doing your rich people things. And I was like, but I'm so misunderstood. Um, you know, so, I wrote this article about my dad that appears in the paper today, yesterday, and um, and uh, I thought there is nothing, people cannot criticize this. It's just about my sweet old dad. There's really nothing negative about it. But it was about how I just told you we trespassed. So I got a scolding note about trespassing <laughs> that you, that it's a very bad example and I as an author would not, you as an author would not like people to come and do that to you, this person said, which I suppose makes sense. Um, but you know, people have all kinds of responses to your work and um, it's, it's interesting to kind of take them in and see, you know, and see what they are. Um, and sometimes they're constructive. Is it fun? Not really fun to get bad, you know, to get mean comments or bad reviews. But the truth is the way the world works right now, you're inundated as an author with Goodreads and Amazon and all the other places that opinions come at you. So you got to develop a thick skin. I don't, I don't know if I can top that question, but um, <laughs> talking about facts, I assume or did you talk to Jamie Wyeth and what was his take and what insight did you gain, if you did, for this novel? So I spoke to neither Jamie Wyeth nor Betsy Wyeth, although I could have, because they're both characters in the book. I just didn't want to do that. I spoke to other Wyeths. So David Rockwell, for example, is uh, Andy's nephew. 
um, and he was incredible. He's a tour guide at the Olson House. He is, has encyclopedic knowledge. I was just emailing with him today. He read my novel, he, he advised me writing it, and then he read my earliest draft. Um, I became really close friends with two other tour guides, and I don't know if any of you are tour guides, but I have come to realize that oftentimes tour guides get completely obsessed with their subject. Um, I describe in the article, in the, in the essay in the back of the book, that um, I was ta the first time I was thinking about this, I, I took a tour of the house, and I had this wonderful 22-year-old you know, girl, college girl, who gave a very fun tour, it had lots of facts, and at the end of the tour, um, I was asking a lot of questions, and she's, someone said, are, what, why are you asking all these questions? I said, oh, I'm wondering about possibly writing about this. At the end, this woman in the back of the room like pulled me over and said, I have been giving tours here since the house opened. Here's my card. I will tell you stories that will knock your socks off. That's what she said. And I was like, how can I resist that? Um, so I called her. I actually went down to visit her in Sarasota, Florida. I, we've become really good friends. Rainy Davis is her name. When I do events in Maine, she like gets up on stage with me. Um, and then another tour guide also similarly um, I developed a relationship with and took me to see other family members of the Olsons and, uh, and of the Wyeths. So I just was, I didn't want to be constrained that much by meeting Betsy and, and uh, I have met Jamie Wyeth before, but not since this book came out. However, I did last, I'll end now, but uh, last August, I, um, oh, it was terrifying. I did my first presentation before the book was out at the Farnsworth, at the Wyeth Museum, 350 people, curators, Wyeths, Olsons, Cushing May, I mean, Cushing Man is like 10 minutes away. It was terrifying um, to have all these experts, um, but it was also great. And I, you know, I think what came out of that for them, and certainly for me, is that I, I really did do my homework, and I think you'll, most people will find that the facts are pretty accurate. One thing I, one thing I, I took liberties with is that Christina was a big reader, but I don't exactly know what she read. There aren't many letters at all that she wrote. So um, Emily Dickinson was very popular at the time, but, and as she is today, but she also had many parallels to Christina's life. And so I kind of intertwined Emily Dickinson um, in, throughout the book. All right, are you wanting me to stop? Are we, are Thank we done? Thank you very much.